happy Sunday. Welcome to Life Church. We're so excited to have you today where everyone is welcome and nobody is perfect. We want you to know that you belong here, regardless of what your journey with Christ has been. But before we get started, we want to give you a couple more things you should know about. So if this is your first Sunday, what a great Sunday to start. First of all, we love new faces and again, are so, so glad that you're here. There should be a connection card on your seat. So great way to get involved, to learn more about the church and make some new friends. Um, speaking of new friends, how to get involved a little bit further and learn more about the church, what we have to offer, what we're really about. Um, if you drop this connection card off in the lobby, it'll be a friendly face behind the table over there. Uh, you can get one of these lovely swag bags. Again, lots of good info for you. Some cool Life Church Michigan swag. Uh, great way to learn a lot more about kind of how we started and how we got to where we are today. If you're online though, and don't have an option to use one of these cards, feel free to go over to connecttolifechurch.com and that way we can still connect with you that way. <laughs> How do you say, is it Encanto? <laughs> Encanto? Encanto. Encanto. That's, that feels right. My phone dings. Should we look it up? <laughs> I'm not sure. Encanto. That has to be it. We're gonna roll with it. One fun thing we have coming up soon is Encanto. Muy bien, si? ¿Sí? Just kidding, I actually haven't seen it yet. Uh, please don't judge me, we, we can't judge here. So regardless though, we're gonna mash family and faith together here at Life Church Michigan coming up on the 4th of March. So put it on your calendars, 7.15 p.m. Family friendly event. We're gonna have the movie on a jumbo screen for everyone to sing along to and enjoy together. Maybe some of us can learn what the movie's about. But coming up regardless, um, keep an eye out for that again on the 4th of March at 7.15 right here. Or, uh, oh, is that online? So apparently we're learning that we can't air an entire Disney movie on Life Church Michigan's website, unfortunately. So with that being said, you would have to be here in person. Feel free to mask up and join us. We'd love to see your faces. Um, but for more details on this event coming up, feel free to see our website on Facebook or uh, lifechurchmichigan.com for more details there. Um, speaking of more details and learning more about Life Church Michigan, we do have a free app available. Um, so feel free to look up Life Church Michigan and you can find lots of great resources there. You can also find us on Roku, Apple TV, all that good stuff by looking up lifechurchmichigan.com. And that is everything that you need to know. So thanks for sticking with me. I appreciate it. Uh, so go ahead and buckle up. Get ready for your time with John. Again, my name is Amy. And with Christ, don't forget the best is always to come. That's not the saying technically, but is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> with Christ, the best is yet to come. Yeah, that's pretty good. But I didn't say that. You know we're going to keep these bloopers. <laughs> Hey everybody, John here. Uh, yesterday, I officiated a wedding. That's why I'm wearing the, the suit. This is my Mary and Barry suit. If you see me in this suit, I'm either there to marry you or to bury you. But the wedding was for our friends, Amy and Rob, who both are part of the band here at Life Church. So we're so excited for their new journey together as husband and wife. And that journey can have highs and lows. Every journey has heartaches, hiccups, and bumps along the road. So today, I thought it would be interesting to take some time and unpack the two biggest topics that are argued about in marriages and offer you some key solutions to regret proof your future. Here we go, it's week three of our series, Swipe Right. You're all 
alone Why don't you use your phone? Why don't you use your phone and try a dating app? Cause you just might find a cute date tonight You can find a date tonight if you just swipe right Alright, how are we doing Life Church? You guys doing good? You fired up? Well, again, my name is John. Thanks so much for being here, both in person and online. It's so great to be with you. And for the next few moments, we're hoping to help you make better decisions and have fewer regrets. That's the big idea behind this series, Swipe Right. And before we dive into the message, I'll tell you that next Sunday is the message. I'll tell you that is a bright series. It's a PG-13 message. So you'll definitely want to check your kids into life kids. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to have a real and honest conversation about same-sex attraction and a conversation about transgender uh, identities. So that's next Sunday. And then two weeks from today, we wrap up Swipe Right with a live Q&A. So you'll be able to text in your real honest questions anonymously from your seats and then I'll be up here I think my wife Amber might be joining me on stage and we'll do our best to give you relationship advice from the scriptures and that'll be two weeks from today so does that sound good yeah some of you're like ooh, ooh, they're going to go there yeah we are that church. So uh, today I want to talk about regret proofing your marriage. And this message is not just for the married people. These tips from the scriptures will apply to you if you're single, divorced, you're engaged, or it's complicated. Whatever your relationship status, we want to regret proof your future. I think marriage gets a bum rap. When I watch TV shows on Netflix or, you know, when I'm kind of cruising through Hulu or on YouTube, people are very quick to make fun of husbands and wives or to be like, it's such a drag. My life was awesome and then I got married. And so today I want to redeem the topic of marriage because I think it's awesome I've been married uh, about 23 years to my high school sweetheart, and it's like a fine wine. It just gets better each year. I think that marriage is kind of like having a slumber party with your best friend, and nobody gets in trouble. It's pretty awesome. And so I have a wedding cake here. I've got a groom. I've got a bride. Studies reveal that marriage is actually good for you. Study after study shows that, that individuals who are married live longer, they make more money, they feel more fulfillment. Now, that's not to diss the single people. Uh, I already talked about this last week, that in 1 Corinthians 7, it's actually awesome to be single. So all the single ladies, all the single ladies, listen, go back, watch last week's message on the app, okay? Singleness, good. But also, marriage is good. Marriage is God's idea. And in Proverbs 18, verse 22, I love Proverbs. Man, if you don't know where to start in the Bible, I always tell people, like, open your Bible or turn on your Bible. Go to Proverbs. Because it's kind of like God's leadership tweets. It's like Twitter in the scriptures. Uh, it just kind of gives you zingers. There's 31 chapters of Proverbs, 31 days in a month. So you could just like bang out the Proverbs and then be like, hey, I read a book of the Bible. But Proverbs 18, 22 says, he who finds a good wife. So men, find a good wife. And if you've already got a ring on your finger, you found a good wife. So stop looking around, okay? Your wife is going, see, the pastor said I'm a good wife. She's a great wife. If you find a good wife, you find a good thing. Men, 
listen, in Genesis, our first dad, Adam, was made in God's image. He was given a job to take care of the earth, but he was a little lonely. Loneliness is not a sin. We were made to be in relationship, friendship, love, friendship. And, and so God created a woman out of the side of the man. And don't miss this. It came out of the side not from the top, so women are not above men. Not from the toe, so women are below men. No, we are side-by-side side partners, okay? We complement one another. Two jigsaw puzzles that psh, come together. And that was a good thing so the man wasn't lonely and the man couldn't pick up his laundry and he couldn't get his act together until Eve showed up and said, Adam, you want some of this? You're going to take care of some of this, okay? So he who finds a good wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Favor is that intangible, God's covering, God's blessing on your life. I always imagine favor like on a rainy day and you, you remember to bring your umbrella and you open up the umbrella and it shields you from getting wet and that's kind of how I picture in my mind God's favor so men if you find a good wife you're gonna find a good life and obtain favor from the Lord so marriage is blessed marriage is a good thing it is unity between two individuals but they're not the same individual. Because women and men are so vastly different. And I know that that's a newsflash to you all. Uh, but in over 20 years of ministry, what I've discovered is that women are beautiful, complicated individuals. They are so complex, I do not understand. Women are like spaghetti. They're like spaghetti. You pull one noodle and the whole thing moves. The glop just goes, Broop. but men are like waffles. We compartmentalize, and we can only think about one thing at a time. So that's why your girlfriend, your wife, she can juggle like five million things and all the details while you're just like, when is Sports Center on? Click. And if you go into the neuroscience, the way that the brain is actually wired, uh, I've shared this before, a woman's brain looks different from a man's brain. A woman's brain has all these connections between the two hemispheres. It's, it's got like information superhighways that can pew, 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 make fast connections. And that's why women are just, they're smart. They're amazing, they're intelligent. But you look at a man's brain under a microscope, and you will not see lots of connections between the two hemispheres. There's like a couple of old rickety country roads. It's like driving through Cotchville, okay? Because information tries to travel the other side, but it stops at those weird stop signs, and, and then it kind of slowly picks up, and, whoa, better slow down. That's how a man thinks. So that's why men can get up go to the refrigerator, open the refrigerator door, and go, oh, I forgot what I came here for. All right, men and women are very, very different, but you put them together in marriage, and it's a beautiful picture of how Jesus relates with the church. Jesus is the groom, the church is his bride. And naturally, when you put one sinner together with another sinner, it's going to lead to more sin. You throw spaghetti with waffles and there's going to be some messes sometimes. And that's okay. Even though conflict is inevitable, today we can choose to not fight in our marriage, but instead choose to fight for our marriage. And some of y'all need to write that down and tweet that out. Because everything you see in the movies, everything you see when you're streaming your favorite show, you're going to see marriage conflict, and they fight in the marriage. But the way of Christ is to fight for your marriage. Marriage is God's idea. God gets a piece of the wedding cake. 
He designed this. He started this. And whatever God starts, the enemy will try to stop. There's a reason why there's relational conflicts. There's a reason why nobody here has a perfect marriage. You can put on a show on the outside, you can have the best pictures on your Instagram, but nobody has a perfect marriage. There will be conflict. God started marriage in Genesis. Genesis 2.24, it says the husband, the man shall leave his, his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It means to be glued, to be attached, to become one new person. And in Genesis 2.24, it says that they were naked and unashamed. Naked and unashamed. That must have been pretty awesome. They put on some, you know, very white. Let's get it all. You've got to be fruitful and multiply, baby. They were naked and unashamed. It's a good thing. Genesis 2.24. God started it, and then the enemy tries to hijack it. Genesis 3.1 says, then the serpent entered the picture. So, naked and unashamed, then the serpent. Naked and unashamed, then the serpent. Naked and unashamed, then the serpent. Whatever God starts, the enemy opposes. And it's crazy because Satan is working overtime through the media, through social media, through, through your conversations. He wants us to hate something that he broke. Hate something... It was the serpent, Adam and Eve. He broke it. Pottery barn. He should be fixing it. But he does not take responsibility for it. Good news. Our second father, our better father, Jesus, the second Adam, he takes responsibility. We broke it. He fixes it. And that's why in every marriage, it needs to be built on something solid. You see this cake has, has something solid underneath these two people. Imagine that that is Christ. You want Jesus at the center of your relationship. So if you're a single person, let me tell you about my friend Ernie. Now, he's not from Sesame Street, but Ernie, he gets a hot date with this girl named Amy. And he wants to put Jesus front and center in the relationship. So as soon as he picks her up at her apartment, the first thing Ernie does is he says, listen, you may think this is weird, and I hope you don't judge me, but I really want to do this right. So could we take a moment and pray before we go out to eat? And this dude humbles himself in the front seat of his car and, and does a simple little awkward prayer. And he's all worried, thinking, what's she thinking? You know what Amy's thinking? This is husband potential right here. This guy is awesome. And you know what happened? They got married. They were fruitful. They multiplied. It worked out great. Put Jesus at the center of the marriage. Build your marriage on the rock. Jesus unifies people. Jesus brings people together. And where there is unity in a marriage, there is power. There is progress. Unity is what Satan fears from Christians. He wants disunity. He wants chaos. He wants things to be torn apart. But God's hand of favor, remember we talked about favor, it's like that invisible umbrella. God's hand of favor is on anything that is united in Jesus' name. So a united church is blessed. A united marriage is blessed. Children growing up to love the Lord, they are blessed. It's just a principle from scripture that God's hand of blessing and favor is on whatever is unified. So when you have disruptions, when you have hiccups, heartaches, headaches, I don't want you to fight in your relationship. I want you to fight for your relationship. Fight for unity. Don't be a bozo the clown and, and try to prove yourself right. All right, don't fight over a position, fight for unity. Listen, I know that you're going to get angry. I know that there's going to be miscommunications in your relationship. But let me tell you something, 23 years of marriage, you will make the greatest speech 
that you will ever regret when you're angry. You got to simmer down. You got to tap the brakes and try to see things through the eyes of your significant other. That's how you fight for unity. Don't assist Satan. He wants this thing to be broken. He wants your relationship to get shattered and for you to have a broken heart. He wants your children to get wounded, seeing mom and dad fighting in the kitchen again. Don't do Satan's work for him. Fight for unity and fight from unity. You've already taken a huge first step coming to church together. Build upon that. Keep putting Jesus front and center because there's so much in life that wants to divide husband and wife. There are other things competing for our attention that want to be at the top of the cake. Things like your job. You are going to be tempted to work longer hours, to get snippy with your significant other, to get demanding. You know, I work so hard. Is it enough to ask for the vacuum to be run a once in a while? There's going to be opportunities for your job to get in between your marriage. Don't let it happen. There's going to be opportunities for social media to get in the way. You know, you sit on the couch. Oh, look, they're so happy. Look at J Chip and Joanna. <laughs> they make lovely children. They've got their own channel. They got a magazine. Why can't you be more like Chip? I love his hair. It's not about the hair, ladies, okay? Uh, social media will try to get in the way. Don't let it. Your kids, your children. Yes, children are a blessing, not a burden. Psalm 127. But sometimes the enemy will turn them into little gremlins. True story. We are dealing with this right now. I have five amazing children. It was funny. Yesterday I officiated this wedding down in Monroe. Uh, at at uh, Amy's childhood uh, church where she was baptized and where she was confirmed. And, and Amy plays keyboard here in our band. Uh, she met her significant other, Rob. He's our bass guitarist. They met here at Life Church. So if you're single and, and you don't have a significant other, just join the church. Stick around for a while. We'll make it happen. And uh, I was there, and it was cool because it's kind of like a reunion when you go to a wedding. You see people you haven't seen in a while, especially after covid and one of Amy's good friends from college, from SVSU, uh, Mallory was there. And Mallory, a couple of years ago, was a ministry intern here at Life Church. And then she graduated SVSU, and now she's in Kalamazoo, just doing wonderful in life. But it was cool to see her. It was kind of like a, a little homecoming. I was like, how are you? How are you? Oh, my goodness. It's so great to see you. And that was just me. And... Um, <laughs> And she was asking about our kids um, because she was working in the kids' area a lot. And so we've got five kids. They, they, they range in age from three is the youngest. Our, our oldest daughter just turned 10 yesterday. So she's only 22 years away from starting to date. And uh, they've got five kids going all the way up into the teenage years. And uh, my youngest daughter, Alicia, she's a sweetheart. Like, she is a pretty, pretty girl, okay? Your kids are ugly. She's beautiful, okay? <laughs> I've seen pictures of your kids on Facebook. No. Uh, so anyhow, Alicia, oh, no. This is what happens when you slam the audience, right? Um, so, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, Alicia has been having, like, nightmares, you know, when you're a small child. And so every night in the middle of the night, she kind of slips into our room and and she'll slip into bed, and she'll snuggle up with Daddy because she wants Daddy's arm around her to protect her. And every night I fall for it, and I know she's probably grinning, you know, oh, I got Daddy. Kids can get in between a husband and a wife. You know, take him to the soccer game, talk, take him to the dance. All those extracurricular things are great, but if your whole life is built on your children when they're out of the house, and that's the goal. The goal is to get them out of the house. Get out. It's like the exercise. Out, out. Get out of the house and still be friends. And if you haven't been dating your wife or dating your husband, you'll have nothing to talk about when they're out of the house. It'll be a very big, empty house. 
But one of the ways that, that Satan uses children is it's ingenious. He'll put them in bed with you. I'm preaching to myself, but dear sir, dear madam, there should be things happening in your married bed that would give nightmares to your child. Get that kid out of your bed and get back with your spouse. I'll take it a step further. Men have lots and lots of sex with your wife. Yeah, some of you only heard the first part. God wants to bring you together. The enemy wants to take you apart. One of the two big areas that uh, couples argue about a lot and that I try to cover in premarital counseling is intimacy. And so I'm not going to go into a whole big message about that because I didn't prepare some of you and you have kids in the room. But um, listen, men, touch your wife's heart before you touch your wife's body. Touch your wife's heart before you touch your wife's body. Whatever you did to woo her and pursue her when you were dating her, keep doing that. If it was going out to the Saginaw River and, you know, having a little picnic, keep doing that. If it was putting on her favorite song on the radio, keep doing that. Date your wife. Date your husband. Because if you don't, someone else will. And so if you're not pursuing your wife, eventually someone else will, and it's, a guy who wants to go up, up, and away. A superman will come in and try to get in between a husband and a wife. And then in an unhealthy relationship, the husband will be like, oh, so you got a superman? Well, listen, I got a Cinderella. And oh, you lost your glass slipper? Let me take you out shop and we'll find you one. And she'll make her way in, Cinderella, that little floozy. Listen. Cinderella, that little floozy. You don't want anything or anyone to get in between what God has brought together. So, man, if there's a super guy in the picture, like, you need to show him the right hand of fellowship and just kick him out of the way. And, and listen, Cinderella, she should not... Well, yeah, she's probably mad at him, too. They can get in the way. There's other thing, the other thing that gets in the way that, that comes up a lot is is this. Money, 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 money. Money. This is a huge argument in relationships and in married couples. It is dealing with money. Usually it's dealing with debt. Statistically, like 90% of the people in this room are up to their eyeballs in debt, whether it's credit card debt or owing somebody something. So I, I get it. Here's the deal. That debt doesn't magically disappear when you walk down the aisle. So whatever's going on in your financial history and in their financial history, it's going to come together and become both of your financial history. And, um, oh, I know some of you are kind of like going, ooh, the pastor's talking about money. No, I'm not about to pass the plate, okay? That's not my thing. In fact, if you're new here today, thanks for giving us a shot. And if you're new here today, later when we do pass the basket, just leave your wallet in your pocket. We're not after your money. I don't want something from you. I want something for you. And this is one of the biggest areas of arguments is, is money and debt. My best piece of advice, especially if you're not married yet, is to deal with the debt monster now. And if you're already married, go out to lunch and let that be the last time you go out to lunch for a while and have a conversation about, you know what? We don't want to be like the rest of the people, the 90%, because they're all broke. We want to get weird. We want to get real. We want to attack the debt and win with our finances. Because the Proverbs say over and over that wise is the woman, wise is the man who has storehouses, who is wise with their money. In fact, Jesus 
spent more time talking about managing money than he did about heaven and hell combined. And, and again, I'm not passing the plate. I'm, you know what? I don't even make money from the church. You realize I'm not on payroll here. I don't receive a paycheck from the church. So when I'm talking about this, this is about helping you to not end up single and alone and fighting over money, but instead to get wise now. And one of the, the best uh, deals that I can tell you about is this one. Here's what I would do if, uh, if I'm in over my eyeballs with, with debt. Um, it's taking some baby steps. You Remember that movie with Bill Murray where it's What About Bob? And he's got the doctor, and, and he's like, Bob, just take baby steps. You don't have to do it all at once. Just take a step forward. So it's, that's what I'm telling you to do with your finances. Take a baby step, baby step, baby step, and honor God with what he has given you. If we can put the baby steps up on the screen, these are seven baby steps. This isn't anything I made up. This is from my friend Dave Ramsey. But these are the simple steps to write down, like pull out your smartphone right now, pull out your iPad, and write down these steps. This is free advice, so you get what you pay for, but this is based on Scripture. The big idea is to save $1,000 immediately because you're going to have an emergency pop up. You're going to have a, a tire fly off your car while you're going down the highway. Or your kid is going to do something dumb and, and break their leg and you have a big co-payment. Instead of scrambling for money and doing GoFundMe or, or pulling out a credit card, save $1,000 now in an emergency fund. I promise you, you're going to have an emergency. Now, birthdays and Christmas are not an emergency. You don't sneak money out of your emergency fund, but you need to start putting money aside now in a separate account that you can't touch unless there's a real, legit emergency. How relieved would you feel today if you knew that you had $1,000 in a savings account in case an emergency pops up? Wouldn't that be an amazing feeling? And so... When my wife and I took this on, we did everything we could on a very tight, limited budget with children to put $1,000 aside right away. We had a garage sale. We started selling stuff that we don't need. It's crazy how we all have things that we buy to impress people we don't know with money we don't have. And so we started selling things on eBay. It was nuts. I started delivering pizzas. I did. Not only was I getting free pepperoni on the side, but I was making tips, y'all. And we were able to really quickly put aside a $1,000 emergency fund. So even today, we have a $1,000 emergency fund in a separate account that's untouchable unless there's a real emergency. So that way, if someone breaks their leg or something happens, we don't have to stress out over how we're going to pay for it. We were wise like the ants that are mentioned in Proverbs who are always setting aside food because winter is coming. Winter is coming, right? So you set aside $1,000 in a beginner emergency fund. Then, if you don't want to end up like this, single, alone, you want to eliminate those fights, get out of debt. Debt is dumb. And it's silly because we send our kids to school where we learn about math and science and social studies and all these wonderful things, but we never ever in middle school or high school teach our kids how to manage their money. And then when you come home and a kid asks mom or dad, hey, how do I open up a checking account? Dad puts down his foot, we don't talk about money in this household. And then we send the kids off to college where the first thing they encounter on orientation day as a freshman is a table with someone saying, get a free t-shirt, sign up for a Visa card. And so I was dumb. I was that kid, right? 18 years old, on my own for the very first time. I'll sign my life away. And I got a t-shirt that took me over 10 years to pay off. You want to pay off all your debts. 
That means sell stuff you don't need. That means get a second job. Do something on Etsy. Become a photographer. Pick up odd jobs. Do whatever it takes to get out of debt. Cut up your, your credit cards. I'm serious. Some of us have discovered debt. We've got a, a visa to misery. We've been mastered by our card. And the scriptures say that the debtor is a slave to the lender. You're enslaved. You owe someone your money. So hurry up, pay it off, close that account, cut up the card, and start moving forward in freedom. How great would it feel to get that monkey off your back? You would have less arguments. Now it means maybe you got to cut back some of the things at home. Maybe you go from two smartphones to one smartphone. Maybe it means you're not subscribing to Netflix or you're not eating out as much. That's probably a good thing. You probably can lose some weight and you'll have extra money to throw at your debt and to get it all paid off. This can happen in uh, six months. It can happen in 12 months. It can happen in two years. It can happen in five years. But do whatever it takes. So I'll speak from, from experience. I will never preach something that I haven't lived. My wife and I took a Dave Ramsey financial freedom course. And we learned all about these baby steps. And we adopted five times. And adoption costs a lot of money. It's very expensive to adopt, right? And so we stopped buying brand new cars. We bought used we stopped eating out all the time. We stopped being frivolous. We don't buy each other Christmas presents. And, and so we, we got into some more debt with student debt and then adoption debt. And then we got serious about paying it all off. And we did it. We paid off our school loans. We paid off, we both had master's degrees. We paid those off. So we finally owned that piece of paper. We paid off all the adoption loans. And I can't tell you how awesome it feels. You just feel like, I can breathe. And that's one less thing to get in between us. That's one less tactic of the enemy. There's less fighting because we've found freedom. These baby steps, you don't have to do this on your own. You have friends here at Life Church who would love to sit down with you and give you advice on how to have a written monthly budget so that you can get that worry and that stress off of your shoulders because eventually you want to learn how to save money to invest money make money work for you to save for college for the kids to pay off your house and then eventually you want to not only build wealth which is biblical but you want to be generous with your wealth and generosity doesn't start tomorrow Jesus taught that it always starts today, that everything we own is God's stuff. We are managers of God's stuff. It's a, an ancient principle that when the king went to war, he would raise up a manager, a steward, who would be over all of the kingdom's assets, all the, the gold and the reserves, all the treasury. And that steward was there to protect, to manage, and to build the king's wealth. So that when the king returned home from war... He would say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've done well with a little now. I will give you more. And so what Jesus taught, what the prophets taught, what was taught outside of God's law is the idea of bringing God your first 10%. It's what is called the tithe. Every month, you and I have a pop quiz from God. It's a test on our faith. How much do I trust God? And in Malachi chapter 3, he says to bring the first 10% because it belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to me. I don't want to be caught stealing the Father's resources. Instead, I want to be generous. I want to open my hand so that I am free from greed and I'm free from self-sufficiency. And I bring the first 10% to the Lord through the local church. And that's me as an act of worship saying, Lord, I am trusting you with the next 29 days that you will, Jehovah Jireh, provide. That is a 
game changer when it comes to not fighting in your marriage, but fighting for your marriage. So what would it look like? What would it look like to have that conversation with your loved one about all these different things we've talked about today? What would it look like to have that, that conversation and say, okay, Pastor John said we've got to have a conversation, so let's talk about the kids. Let's talk about my job. Let's talk about intimacy. Let's talk about our finances. Let's get it out there so that we can build unity in this relationship. Because I don't know about you, but I'm tired of fighting all the time. And what would it look like to fight for your marriage instead of fighting in your marriage? Listen, I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. We have a ton of resources free on our website and on our app. There is a free devotional that uh, takes you 14 days towards a better marriage that you could do with your loved one. There is another devotional that's all about uh, finding financial freedom, and it's free and anonymous. It's all on our app, all on our website. My gift to you, because again, I don't want something from you. I want something for you. Let me pray for you. Lord God, thank you for this church family where we can have these conversations opening up the scriptures, seeking wisdom, regret-proofing our relationships. God, each one of us is wrestling with something in our lives. Each one of us has the potential for either a stronger relationship or, or a weaker one. So, Father, would you send your Spirit and enable us to have the tough conversations in the coming days. Whatever it is that's become taboo to talk about, would you give us the courage to faithfully open up to our loved one, to build bridges of trust, bridges of healing over topics that continue to divide us? God, I pray that that all across this room and, and online, that there would be couples that would use some of these resources on our website and on our app to discover freedom in intimacy, freedom with raising their children, freedom with their personal finances, so that they would stop the fights, stop the pettiness, stop the arguments. And God, as we move now towards one last song of worship, we pray that these lyrics would be glorifying to you. We pray that as we give of our tithes and offerings, you would use these gifts, this act of generosity, to fuel your mission here at Life Church of reaching more people far from God. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for this final song.